Good day. My name is Mike Ehrenstein, and I'm the 2022 president of the Litigation Council of America. I'm here today with my friend Merrill Macklin, who is a fellow of the Litigation Council of America. And we're here to talk a little bit about the virtues of humility in a trial practice. So before we get into the topic, let me take 30 seconds to give you all the reasons why Merrill should really not be humble. She is a leader at Brian Cave's renowned M&A uh, disputes practice group. Merrill specializes in the resolution of high exposure cases and has as lead counsel tried multi-week jury trials for the likes of Oracle, Union Pacific, and Clearwave Communications, and she has done so successfully. Merrill previously uh, was the litigation department chair and was a member of her executive committee. She is the incoming president, I'm glad to say, of the uh, commercial, Complex Commercial Litigation Institute of the LCA. And with all of these accomplishments under her belt, one could easily understand why Merrill should be or could be less than humble. But she remains a paragon of humility. And that is, I think, part of her nature. And it's also part of her choice. And so what I would like to do today is uh, talk with Merrill a little bit about why humility is so important in the trial practice, in our trial practices. So first, welcome Merrill. Thank you, Michael. It's nice to be here. And I enjoy these podcasts, as you know, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Great. So let's start with this. When, when did you first start thinking about humility in trial practices? When I was a very young lawyer, I, I already started thinking about it because I worked very closely with someone who's no longer living, but he was my first mentor and was really a, a not just a great trial lawyer, but he was also a great appellate lawyer. He had the ability to, to span every range of, of the practice. He was very, very well respected by many people. And I saw very early on in practice that he, had, he sort of embodied the qualities that I think of as humility. He was very unassuming in his manner, even though he was extremely smart, very effective, and I think actually did think very highly of himself, but his manner and the way he came across was very humble. And I saw him in a very formative situation for me, just incapable of lying, incapable of taking an extreme position, really just telling the truth. And, and in one situation, almost begging a judge for relief in a case in a way that had a courtroom wrapped listening to him. And, and I realized from watching this that that was kind of a secret sauce for him. And, and it was so effective and it really resonated for me because it said to me, I don't have to be a grandstander. I don't have to take positions I don't believe in. I don't have to do things that I'm not comfortable with in order to be an effective lawyer. And I, that, I just have thought about that so many times through the year. And, and he really, I mean, you could tell the emotion in my voice. I feel so strongly about this man. This is, we're talking about, 36 years ago, probably 37 years ago, these, these events occurred, but he was really that important a person to me. It's interesting. One of the things that you said, he, he actually, on, on the one hand was unassuming, but on the other hand, he thought highly of himself. Those were your words. So it, you're reminding me of, of uh, a definition that I read as we were preparing for this. There was, and it's, it's a quote, uh, that has been attributed, at least on the internet, to C.S. Lewis. I don't know if he really said this or not, but it's attributed to him somewhere on the internet. And the quote is, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And it sounds like maybe that is kind of where your mentor was. He had a high opinion of himself. He knew he was smart. He knew he, he had good ar arguments. 
but he also knew that he didn't need to be a grandstander in order to be effective. That's, I think that's a very, very good way of putting it. And, and I, I looked up, I looked up um, humility as well. And I found a, just a bland dictionary definition that said it was freedom from pride or arrogance. And I think that's exactly, you can think that you're a great lawyer. You can think that you're smart, but not be prideful or arrogant about it. Just so, be confident in your position. So, so it's, it's interesting, the reality of trial lawyering versus the myth of trial lawyering and how they are, in some cases, just misaligned. So it, it, in, in this, in particular, with, with, with respect to humility, the best trial lawyers I have seen are humble. And, and yet the, the public perception of the effective trial lawyer is somebody who's got an outsized ego, who's arrogant and full of braggadocio. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts about maybe why that is. Why, why is it that there's this disconnect between the, the reality and the myth? Well, the unfortunate truth is that we watch a lot of movies and TV um, <laughs> portrayals of, of a trial lawyer who is arrogant and kind of outsized in his aggression and braggadocio staggering around, swaggering around the court, maybe staggering too, around the courtroom. Um, but when it comes to what we really do and what a trial is really like, what really matters is can you be trusted? Does the judge trust you? Does the jury trust you? Even does opposing counsel trust you? Um, does your client trust you when you tell the client what it is that you want the client to do or to say? And trust, I think, is earned by humility, not by arrogance, because everybody recoils, I think, from somebody who's trying to tell them what to do in a way that asserts this assumption that that person is right and knows everything that they're talking about. Where if you bring somebody into a conversation, um, show that you trust them, that person's going to give you back that trust as well. And that's the key, I think, to being an effective, whether it's a trial lawyer or just an advocate in the office, day to day with clients, in deposition, whatever we all are doing, even outside the courtroom. So, so um, I, I've, I've witnessed before lawyers counseling clients as they were getting engaged. Listen, if you wanna win this case, you better do everything I say. And I, I, I guess that's arrogant, that it's not humble, right? But on the other hand, the, most successful lawyers and have successful lawyer client relationships are the one I think are the ones where perhaps there's more of a conversation, more questions being asked, more listening being done rather than dictating, right? I completely agree. And I think you can't really know my goal in my practice is always to serve the client and serve the client's needs. If the client doesn't tell me what it wants or what he or she wants, I can't really go forth with an approach that is going to achieve what the client wants. And I think the lawyers make a big mistake in telling the client up front if you want to win the case X, because the client could very well have a very different objective than the one that you are assuming the client has. So listening is absolutely key to, to everything that's going on. The lawyer, the judge, I've seen lawyers in court talking over the judge, interrupting the judge, telling the judge what the judge wants to hear. And I've even seen a judge tell a lawyer to sit down and to stop it because it was not serving what the judge wanted. And I'm sure that that, that interaction didn't build the trust between the lawyer and the judge that the lawyer needed in order to be an effective advocate. Absolutely. And I had, I had a funny situation. I mean, this was not really to my benefit, but it was really funny. A case where 
we lost every single thing that we did. Every motion we lost, all right. the way up to. I don't believe it because I know, I know you too well. There's never been a case that you've lost everything. We we this one we were losing everything. But interestingly, the judge very much disliked the lawyers on the other side from a firm I will not mention, um, and would actually look to me to give the reasons why she should rule against me. It was a very uncomfortable situation because there I was unable as my mentor to lie to the judge or to, to give the judge an argument that I didn't believe in. And she knew that she was gonna get the truth from me right. and yet she was gonna rule against me. It was a very odd situation, but I still couldn't stop being just who I was. And so I felt like if I'm ever in front of that judge again, I have that credibility, I have that reputation. And that to me, walking out of the room is, is as important as, you know, I mean, the facts were in the law were why we were losing, right? It wasn't me. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. I mean, have you seen how arrogance or humility of a lead counsel, I mean, you were lead counsel in these three giant cases that um, took 10 week jury trial, six week jury trial. Um, as lead counsel, you had a team of people that you were working with. If how how does the interplay of of between arrogance and humility work within the team as opposed to with 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 the court? I have always felt, and I still do this, even though I, I'm pretty advanced in this practice um, in terms of time in the saddle. I always think that what the junior people have to say is very, very important and sometimes more important than what the C or what I or some of the more senior people have to say. And I have always asked the junior people for their opinions as if they were really a peer of mine, because in a way they are. And I, when I started practice, I remember thinking maybe this isn't a terribly humble view, but I remember thinking that the difference between me and the partners was not that they knew more or that they were better, but that they were older and they had been doing this longer. And that didn't mean, and they, they solicited, I copied what I learned. They solicited me for my opinions. They valued what I had to say. I was the one close to the research. I was the one close to the documents. And I treat the associates um, in the same way. And I try to teach by example in the same way that I learned by example. And, and one of those trials, um, we, ha we had an episode and I think it's still, the people on that team still think about it um, and mention it to me where we had an argument. I can't exactly remember what it was, but we had been taking a position and we were going to present um, an offer of proof on this and do a whole big thing in the trial. And ultimately I decided that it wasn't working for what it was we were trying to accomplish. And so we told the judge, or I told the judge, we weren't gonna do it. We were gonna abandon the argument and we were gonna do something different. And I had, I guess I talked to the team about it a little bit ahead of time and they all freaked out about really, you're gonna go up there and admit that we had a flawed strategy. Um, but I ignored them and because I, I believed in it. And we had been in front of this judge for a long time in this trial because this was, I don't know, the third or fourth phase of it. And so I stood up and I withdrew the argument and I could feel behind me all of this anxiety. And after, after the session, everybody was like, I, I couldn't believe it. What were you doing? You were giving up. How could you admit we were wrong and we had this... Um, misguided position. And I said, it was the right thing to do. We just had to do it. We weren't going to win. We weren't going to prevail. And in the end, I do believe, I mean, we were doing well in front of this judge anyway, but we won everything after that because the judge just trusted us and he did not trust the other side. And in the same kind of way that um, the judge was looking to me to give the reasons why I should lose. This judge was looking to us for the reasons we should win. And to me, that's the name of the game. You get that reputation, you get that credibility, and, and you're done. And if it means admitting you're wrong 
or you don't know something. I mean, I do that with clients all the time. And again, this is something I learned as a young lawyer. Client asks you a question don't, and you don't know the answer, don't make it up. Don't tell them something that might not be true. Say, you know what, I'm really not sure what the answer to that is. Let me think about it. Or, you know, I need to have somebody do some research into that. I've got some ideas about it. Um, and it's something we all learn to do over time, but um, you see people very, very uncomfortable with that position. And, and I think in the end, you know, again, I know I'm saying it over and over, but again, I think it earns you more respect to admit what you don't know. I think that it's very difficult for a lawyer who has won lots to have the the humbleness to actually openly actively listen not just to to the client to the judge to listen or to pay attention to really pay attention to what's happening in the courtroom with the jury to listen to the associates to actually hear what they're what what the pe the people on their team say because i'm the lawyer that won i i come on it's about me <laughs> right instead of, of being able to actually, there was something I read, um, I think one of your colleagues wrote it, that the, the, the humble lawyer actually enjoys, wants his teammates or her teammates to be able to point out the weaknesses in your arguments and to make you think about it differently. So it's, what you said a, a minute ago about soliciting input from, from other members of the team reminded me of that because every member of the team brings something different to the table, right? There's a different perspective, a different handle on the facts, a different view of the law, um, a different view of how it's going to mesh or how it's going to be presented. And all of that, if you're arrogant, it's my way or the highway doesn't work. Whereas if you can have the humility to absorb it, perhaps you can be more effective. Yeah. And another thing that I have come to, and after many, many years of practice in big firms where it is routine to have multiple lawyers attend every event. Um, and that's not something that I did as much when I was younger, but I have come to see the value of making sure that I have another person in the room at key arguments or depositions because I can't watch everything. I can't think of everything. And I really need somebody there who's got eyes and ears on everything else that's going on. And um, I, I don't think of it the way that I did earlier in my career as maybe, you know, just kind of not padding, but you know, just kind of unnecessary excess of lawyers. There's really a, a true value in that because you can, you're not acting, you're not talking in the echo chamber of your own head, then you're you're getting valuable input from others. Agreed, especially in trial, right? I mean absolutely. Let's let's think about I I, I know that after every trial, I am so mentally and emotionally spent. I, I'm, I'm, it, I'm, I'm bordering on almost, it's not depression, but I'm, I'm, I, I need a couple of days to just recharge the batteries, right? And the reason for that, I believe, is because we're, when we're in trial, we're operating on such a high level. We're paying attention to the judge. We're paying attention to everything that every single one of the jurors is doing. We're paying attention to the facts. We're paying attention to the law. We're paying attention to the witness on the stand. And we are focused, hyper-focused on all of this simultaneously. There's no way that we can do that by ourselves as well as we can do it with a team, especially in a big, in a big case, right? Yeah. So um, can, can you, I know, I know you touched on an example or two. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you share with us an example of an instance in which you saw arrogance just fail hard or an example in which you witnessed um, the, the, the persuasiveness of, of humility? 
I'm going to go back on, on the persuasiveness of humility. I, I touched on this earlier, but I really want to talk about this because it was such an important event for me. Um, so this mentor that I've talked about, uh, this was a case I it was back in the early 90s. It was one of those failed savings and loan cases. And we represented a big accounting firm and an individual who was responsible for the account at the firm. And that individual had taken the fifth up to that point. And the judge had given a drop dead date by which people had to either make a determination to maintain their assertion of the fifth or waive it. And that date had passed, but our client had been informed that he was no longer you know, a target or, or anything in the investigation, the federal criminal investigation. So he was gonna be free to testify. And we knew it was gonna be an uphill battle with the judge to convince him um, that, that we should be able to, to do that. And this lawyer came in, Larry Kopowski was his name, in case anybody knows him. Um, he came in and he really essentially begged the judge to allow our client to testify. And, and as much as said, you are putting us in a situation where we could lose because of this. You are effectively punishing our client because of this. You could have heard a pin drop in that courtroom. There were the leading lights of the Los Angeles bar, in this case was in Arizona, but most of the, the other parties were um, represented by LA firms and the leading lights of the Arizona bar, the courtroom was packed and he was begging. I mean, it didn't work, but I'll tell you, he got the respect and admiration of every single lawyer in that room. I watched nine or 10 lawyers come up to him afterwards and congratulate him on a good argument and on what he had done, even though he didn't win. And I thought, wow, that's a, such an important thing that just happened because he's now got, he already had the respect of all of these people, but they've so admired him and so respected what he had done. And I felt like a lot of those lawyers probably couldn't have done it themselves but they recognized how, what an accomplishment it was to have done that. And I, that just still sticks with me. It was really a wonderful moment. So, so that's interesting. I mean, the, the, the humbleness of, of having to beg and it, to, to the judge, even though he, he lost the battle, was there a strategic value to the case in having done that even though you lose the battle, maybe you, it, it, it adds to your arsenal to win the war. It adds to your trust arsenal. Absolutely. And I firmly believe we wouldn't have won that motion anyway. And he knew that. He knew that the only possible path to winning was that approach. And that was, I think, what stuck with me is that an arrogant lawyer who goes in guns blazing with a very strong and aggressive argument really ceding no ground is not, in my opinion, sometimes able to see that you, you could win by taking a lesser position, by giving up some of your argument, by looking at the long game instead of just what's going on right at the moment. And I, I think that for me, to me, the arrogant lawyer, and this is what I find very, very frustrating when they're opposing me, is somebody who needs to win every single battle, who doesn't understand that you can seed points, lose here, agree here, and still get for your client ultimately what you need to get, whether that's in negotiation or you know, motion practice or in a trial. So humility becomes almost, it's, on the one hand, it's part of your character. It's part of who you are. On the other hand, it's, it sounds like it can be used with strategic effect. You can, you, can, you can play the humble card and hope to gain more trust to be used down the line in the case. Do you see that happening? I do see that happening. And I'm a little conflicted about it, to tell you the truth, because I feel like it's not really consistent with my view of humility to use it strategically. Um, and I guess all I have to say about that is if it works, you know, it works and you use it. Um, and everybody has developed for him or herself 
an approach to all of these things that works. And, and I do notice myself sometimes using humility strategically um, because it can be a bit of a secret weapon. And I think, you know, even with all the experience that I have, I still find that I'm not discounted, but thought a little less of because of my gender. And I do think that's very real. And I think it's more difficult for women to take a strong and arrogant position um, because they're much more easily dismissed that way. And so sometimes you just have to use that, you know, to your own advantage. And so, yeah. I, I wonder how much of the humility in order to be effective if it if it if it's transparently being used as a strategic tool, if 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 it can sort of boomerang on you, uh, or 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 if it really has to be genuine and authentic in order to be effective. Yeah, and I think, and we all know people who who are phonally phonally that's probably not a word who are phony in their friendliness or phony in their accommodation of things or whatever it is. And, and we can all spot that. So yes, I think that's right. And I think if you use something, maybe then arrogance you when used strategically, if it's authentic, <laughs> becomes okay. I don't know, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. It just seems like genuine humility is a wonderful virtue and, and, and something that we as trial lawyers should be aware of and should, should, should should use um, false humility seems like it's a dangerous place to go and that arrogance might be better than false humility, right? Maybe. Yeah, I, you know, I have always had the view the entire time I've practiced that they, you win or lose on the facts and the law and the judge. I can't say I have seen more than two or three things where I thought that the lawyering made a difference and that we won because of the lawyering. And that's even against lawyers who are not good lawyers, but it's rare because the judges are usually seeing exactly what's going on. And, and once you see that and you know that, um, I think that arrogance and thinking that you're, you, you're somehow responsible for all of it, um, and it's a dangerous place to go. Right. I mean, I guess part of humility is recognizing that we can't, as trial lawyers, as much as we think that it's a, it's my show, it ain't about us. And there's certain things we can't control. Right. Right. Exactly. And that, I guess that, that kind of acts not, not only as a, uh, it's, it's a salve for our soul when we lose and, and it's also something that is supportive of the system, of our system of, of, of law. And maybe as much as anything, that's where arrogance is coming from, is that fear that there's no control. And so maybe we can seize control, or maybe the arrogant lawyer can seize control by not allowing there to be anything but the position that they're taking and by kind of asserting him or herself right in the middle of things and, and making it about them. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it is because it, it's a scary place to be when you can't control what's going on and, and when you, you may lose the entire case based on something that, that the judge says or, or the jury says. So um... Do you have any any thoughts on on summing up, kind of pulling it all together uh, for for our audience about the the virtue and wisdom of humility as in our trial its necessity in our trial practices? Well, for me, it's it's something that I can't help. So it is kind of who I am. If I've made a mistake, I admit it. If I have taken a wrong path, I change directions and. I found that what that's led to is, is credibility for me and a reputation that I want to protect. And so I think that that's all we really have is our reputations. And if our reputations are that we are truth tellers and we are reasonable and we are straight up the middle and we admit when we're wrong or when something's not working, 
those are the kind of people that clients want to hire. Those are the kind of people that judges want to listen to. And those are the kind of people that opposing counsel respect. Meryl, thank you so much for giving us your time and for sharing with us your wisdom today. Thanks, Mike. It was fun. It was really fun. Thanks.